Well, I'm excited to begin this journey into the book of Hebrews <clears throat> with you tonight. So you can turn to the book of Hebrews. We'll begin in chapter one of the book. We'll look at the first four verses this week, and then Joey will take us through chapter one at least in its entirety next week. Um, and as we begin this journey, we'll move at a pretty fast clip, but uh, I- I'm hopeful that you will have uh, this book, um, be able to kind of wrap your arms around this book by the end. I think we're going to try to preach this in 10 or 11 weeks. Um, And as we said last week in the Q&A, Hebrews goes deep uh, pretty quickly, and we'll experience that tonight. Um, But I'm excited for the realities of Christ that are going to absorb our hearts and minds this semester. So let's read uh, Hebrews chapter 1, the opening four verses. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he created the world. He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs." This is the very word of the living God. I want to open this introductory sermons into this book with um, a fictional scene that will hopefully get our minds absorbed into the context uh, to the people who received this message. It's 2,000 years ago, likely in Rome, this message would have been preached uh, to, a, to a very specific audience in a specific season and stage of life. And so, so I want to open by filling our minds with the scene as many of the members in the church would have experienced it 2,000 years ago. We'll read about a fictional character named Antonius. Antonius sat alone in a deteriorating second-story apartment located in a slum on the slope of Esquiline Hill in Rome. As rain pelted the age-worn wall outside, a plate of bread and vegetables and a cup of sour wine rested on the makeshift table. The room had turned dark with the coming of this storm, and Antonius, Antonius lit a small oil lamp against the gloom. With the light, hungry roaches materialized, scampering to the dark safety of cracks in the wall. In the apartment next door, a baby cried, and the infant's father screamed obscenities at the infant's mother. An urgent conversation rose and then faded as an unseen pair of business partners walked down the stairs. Somewhere in the muddy street below, a unit of Roman soldiers marched past, driven under sharp orders from its commander. Antonius sat alone, thinking. That morning, his employer, a rough, burly fellow named Brutus, once again turned from the task of pricing fruits and vegetables to ridicule this young Christian. The verbal jabs had become as annoying as gnats darting to and fro in the shop's pungent air. Brutus was big, obnoxious, and cruel. Antonius cringed against the man's emotional blows, wishing he could strike back out of hurt and embarrassment. Each time he turned the other cheek, It received a slap in kind. Yet he bit his lip, nursed his wounded pride, and again asked the Lord's forgiveness for his thoughts. Persecution of the church in Rome had yet to result in martyrdom, but since the expulsion of Jews under Emperor Claudius, Christians had continued to be harassed to various degrees by both Jews and pagans. Upon the expulsion, some had suffered imprisonment, beatings, and the seizure of their properties. That was almost 15 years ago now. 
Antonius had not yet been part of, or had not been part of the Christian church at that time, but he had heard about those conflicts. In fact, his own grandfather, ruler of the synagogue of the Augustans, had been one of the most outspoken opponents of the Christians. When at 17, Antonius converted to Christianity, the old man almost died, declaring Antonius dead in a shouting match that ended in tears and a tattered relationship. In recent months, abuse of the church had escalated with the amused approval of the emperor himself. And now emotional fatigue was taking its toll. Footsteps in the hall, a scream in the night, meaningless events that nevertheless set Antonius' heart racing. He had been told the cost of following Jesus the Messiah, but somehow his experience was different than he expected. In the beginning, he thought his joy would never be broken, that he would always feel the presence of God. He had been taught that the Lord, the righteous judge, would vindicate his new covenant people. Did not the scriptures speaking of the Messiah say that God had put all things in subjection under his feet? But the church had taken a great beating lately and members of its various house groups had become discouraged and were questioning whether Christ was really in control at all. In their hearts, they wondered if God had closed his ears against their cries for relief. Some, in their disillusionment, doubted and left the church altogether. Antonius bar David remembered the traditions of the synagogue and the support of the Jewish community, the joy of the festivals and the solemn celebrations of the Jewish calendar. He appreciated the fellowship of Christ's community, but genuinely missed the traditions of his ancestors, and he missed the members of his family. He'd watched them from a distance as they walked together to market by the Tiber River. Some of them still would not speak to him, and passed him on the street as they would a Gentile. That was difficult. And today, his loneliness closed in around him like a dark, damp blanket. To make matters worse, he was one of the poorer members of the church. When Antonius became a Christian, he lost his job as a tailor's apprentice in the Jewish quarter. He now spent his days sorting rotting produce, sweeping the floor, swatting flies, and receiving orders from obnoxious Roman slaves shopping for rich mistresses. He stooped so low as to take pieces of rotten fruit home to supplement his meager food supply. Even rich men's slaves fared better. Earlier in the week, Gaius, the kitchen slave of an equestrian who lived in the area, tossed him a handful of overripe figs saying, Here, Christian, change your cannibalistic diet by taking a bit of good fruit. Laughter hung with the gnats in the air. To be poor and a Christian invited double portions of ridicule. Antonius had missed the weekly meal of fellowship for the past two weeks at church, and his heart had cooled somewhat toward that little house group. A spiritual itch in the back of his spirit warned him, cautioning him concerning his loss of perspective, yet in recent days he had begun to snuff such thoughts from his mind as quickly as they came in. Antonius' bitterness over his current circumstance was growing and slowly obscuring the truth. Hmm. It's a familiar scene, isn't it? I think it's a scene that as Christians we are familiar with or for some of you younger Christians um, will be familiar with. Notice Antonius is wrestling. He's being poked for his Christianity. He's starting to struggle even with his desire for the things of the Lord. And it's not gaining him any friends and it's certainly losing him family and relationships. And so he begins to neglect the church, even beginning to doubt his own faith in Jesus as Messiah. Christian, there are times in your life where you will feel like Antonius. If you haven't yet, it's coming. This, this world is, it's hard. 
It's hard to flourish in a world constantly pulling at your flesh. It's hard to go day in and day out in a world that ridicules you for the thing you love most, your relationship with Jesus Christ. How will you make it to the end in such a dangerous world? We see so many caving in around us, don't we? Apostasy. It seems every year we hear of a high-profiled Christian falling in apostasy. How many more beside us in the church? Think of the friends you know who maybe even in this group used to sit next to you and they're gone. The friends in high school who claim to be a Christian but they hit college and they're out. How will we make it to the end? How will we endure in a world fraught with temptation and suffering and persecution? Some of you have heard me tell the story of my friend, Adrian, who years ago was one of the most zealous evangelists I knew and slowly began to disappear from the church and go back to his old friends. And I remember after months of not seeing Adrian, as he was back in the world, partying, drinking, I I convinced him to meet with me, and we sat across the table from one another with a pizza between us, and with tears in his eyes, Adrian said, "I, I never thought this would be me. I think he made it to church one more time, and then that was it. Into the world he went. And Adrian, last year, passed away, having never repented. Friends, apostasy is real. The dangers of this world are real. And we can begin to feel them very heavily on our souls. How will we endure? I want to take you back another or 2,000 years again to a Sunday morning in the same context when this book was preached. Hebrews is most likely a sermon that was preached and written down. We're not sure who preached it. There's many theories, many potential authors. Some say Paul, but I think the majority consensus it was probably not Paul. But regardless of who preached it, I want us to think just for a moment, get out of Antonius's experience and into the mind of this preacher on a Sunday morning. He's thinking of men like Antonius. His people are struggling. You're struggling in his congregation, discouraged, disheartened, sin-plagued, persecuted, and beginning to doubt. You can think of that preacher on the front row thinking, what have I got for them? Studying through the week, thinking, what, what message can I give my discouraged, beaten down people? The preacher, in the end, decides to give them the antidote to their struggle. He gives them Jesus. (laughs) On this particular Sunday, this preacher launches into a detailed, passion-filled, theologically profound, yet intensely and immediately practical exposition of the person of Jesus Christ. That's what Hebrews is an exposition of Jesus. And the culmination and conclusion of this sermon is that Jesus is better. He's better. How? How how is he better? Well, these opening verses set the stage Like any good sermon, they sort of set the roadmap for what's to come. Not only in the content of what is given, but also in the style of how it's given. The content of Hebrews is all about Christ and his superiority and why he's better than whatever you're being tempted to leave him for. But the style in which it's given is comparison. So if the content is Christ, the style is comparison. Um, What I mean is 
um, this preacher doesn't come along to his people and simply disregard what is alluring them away. So many preachers do this. Maybe you, you've had preachers do this. They do this especially with children. Sin is no fun, guys. Follow Jesus. The parties don't even, that's, that, has, that has no appeal. Just follow Jesus. Um, and they seek to sort of paint the world as non-alluring in order to make sure you just stick with Jesus. So that, you know what, don't even bother looking over there. Um, just, just keep your eyes on Jesus. And essentially, it's almost a lie because there isn't a lure to sin, isn't there? Isn't it Moses who said that sin had pleasure in Hebrews eleven twenty five, 25? But it's fleeting pleasure, which produces death, but it has pleasure. The, the, the preacher doesn't come along and just simply say, oh, guys, you know, just forget your sin, stop it. No, he, he enters into the allurement. He gets it. He understands what a man like Antonius is struggling with. He enters into the suffering. I know it's hard. I remember how your homes were plundered and everything was taken from you. I get it. He doesn't simply scold them and say, stop being so stupid, you sinner. Why would you ever be tempted with that? No, no, no. He enters into their pain. He enters into their struggle. He doesn't make light of it. It's very pastoral. But then in each instance, entering into their temptations with sin and their struggling with suffering, he, he carefully shows them how even still, Jesus is better. He, he's better than what's tempting you. He's worth what you're enduring. And so this preacher, with such a pastoral tone, shows the appeal and the allure and the power of temptation, but then labors to argue, showing that Jesus Christ is better. And um, it hits with this sort of rhetorical force. Instead of him just coming out and saying, guys, Jesus is best. Forget everything you're wrestling with. Just look at Jesus. It hits with a force for him to kind of walk us through the pain, to walk us through what's tempting us, to walk them through the suffering, and then to come out on top and say, and even after all of this, Christ is still better. And so, friends, what we have here, I, I want you to hear uh, Hebrews as it was preached. I want you to enter into the world of, of this Sunday morning when this preacher stood up and began to open his mouth and to hear it as a pastor pleading with his people. The style is immediately evident in the opening words. Long ago, look at verse one. Long ago, at many times and in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets. And notice this, but in these last days. He's already beginning this comparison. You're going to see this throughout the book. Compare and contrast, compare and contrast. Compare the allurement of sin, contrast the goodness of Christ. Compare the old covenant, contrast it with the, the new covenant. Compare the mediation of angels, compare with the mediation of Christ. Compare and contrast, compare and contrast. And he introduces us to that style of preaching immediately when he says, long ago, in many ways, God revealed himself. And that previous revelation long ago was truly astonishing. Just think about what's included in the many ways. You think about the Old Testament, the theophanies, where the angel of the Lord would appear and wrestle with Jacob. Think about the burning bush where God speaks to Moses in a, a bush engrossed in flames yet not consumed. Think of the dreams that the prophets would receive, the prayers and the answers to prayers. Many ways God spoke to the fathers of Israel by the prophets. But now, in these last days, 
There's a finality to it. There's a force to it. He has spoken to us by his son. This reminds us of the transfiguration, doesn't it? That sense of finality where in Luke 9, uh, Peter, James, and John are, are stood with Christ and they appear with Jesus in, in this glorious light, Elijah and Moses. And in their astonishment, a voice comes from heaven, the voice of God the Father, this is my son, my chosen one, listen to him. It's a vivid illustration that these men once revealed God, but now the Son has come to reveal God. And can I just reiterate what Joey said last week, which what I thought was so insightful. Um, before we delve deeper into the revelation of Christ, we should take note of that call to listen. Um, in the transfiguration, God says, listen to him. And the next words we read, this is Luke 9, 36. When the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone. Moses, Elijah disappear. And the disciples, listen to what it says. They kept silent. There's something to be learned there for us in our struggle against sin, in our suffering from persecution or circumstance, in our doubting of Christ. There's something to be learned here in listening. Listen. Enter that quiet place because God has something to say. What is it? That Jesus is better. Don't go back. Don't give in. Don't stop. Listen to what God is saying to you. And, and friends, I think if, if we were only to have more moments of listening, sometimes we're wrestling with sin and we get so busy trying to find the solution. Stop. Listen to the word of God speaking to you. What does he have to say? The preacher immediately takes us into the depths of Jesus Christ. One man said that in these opening four verses, some of the more challenging and developed Christology of the entire New Testament is contained. And, and I want us to work through it as exhaustively as we can in this time, but I, I, I want us to see seven realities that the author shows us about Christ to show us that he's better. Seven realities. Long ago, at many times, in many ways, God spoke to our fathers by the prophets, but in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. Who is his son? Let's look at the first reality, and it's this, Jesus the heir. By his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things. And immediately to this Jewish and Jewish informed audience, uh, we have an Old Testament reference. This is Psalm 2 verse 8, immediately referenced, which says, uh, ask of me and I will make the nations your heritage, the ends of the earth your p possession. That great messianic song of victory, a song praising the son of God, the Messiah, as the one who will conquer and rule all the kings of the earth. This immediately introduces us to Jesus as the one who fulfilled Israel's messianic hope. I mean, this psalm, Psalm 2.8, would have been well-known, frequently sung. And so the, the, the preacher immediately points to this messianic hope of Jesus as Messiah. And why is that psalm so great? What does it mean to be heir of all things? It is the authority of Jesus Christ. The Son of God being placed over the rulers of this world. 
makes you think of Jesus' last, or not last words, but those last words in uh, Matthew's gospel, doesn't it? All authority in heaven on earth has been given to me. Jesus, the heir, the Messiah of Psalm 2, who though the nations rage with an illusion of autonomy and power, he will rule over them with power. He then shows us Jesus, the creator, through whom also he created the world. Listen to these statements, John chapter 1, beginning in verse 3. I know we know it well. Let me get there. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. Colossians 1, David recited it before singing that last song where he says in Colossians 1, beginning in verse 16, For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. This Jesus is the creator of all things. God spoke and things came to be, creating by this world and by his word, this world by his word. And Jesus is the word of God, which shows us that he has made all things. So anything you see in this world, if you see it, Jesus made it. And it's interesting to note the word here for um, world or universe is a, a word which means ages. And it's used differently in the Bible for both temporal and spatial realms, time and space. And so what the preacher is saying by using that word is that Jesus made it all, time and space. Every dimension of this reality was made by Jesus. Not only is Jesus the heir and the creator, but look at this statement in verse 3. He is the radiance of the glory of God. Simply put, Jesus, the radiance of glory, encapsulates the, the majesty of God. Now, glory is a big theme in the book of Hebrews. It really dominates at points. Uh, eight times we'll, we'll hear of the glory of God in this book. And before I think we can understand that Jesus is the radiance of the glory of God, we've got to understand what is the glory of God. Um, there's different words that are used for glory. I think the most common throughout the Old Testament scriptures is that word kavod, which means weightiness or heaviness. And it, it speaks of God's substance, his, his worth. He, it, you could think about it like, um, it like gravitas. God is heavy. He, he, is, he is of substance and worthy of worship. He has influence. And we see that this weightiness of God, his glory is is the demonstration of his character. Uh, a helpful illustration to, to think of glory is um, the demonstration of God's perfections, his perfect character. So the seeing of his majesty is, is his glory. And all throughout the Old Testament, we hear of the glory of God being revealed, whether it's, whether it's in a pillar of cloud uh, or, uh, or a pillar of fire or a, a, a pillar of cloud or whether it's in the tabernacle through, through fire descending on Mount Sinai, we see God's glory depicted throughout the scriptures. In the Psalms, we see his glory displayed in storms, in, in battle, in creation. The prophets speak all over of his glory revealed in judgment and in salvation. Glory is the demonstration of God's perfect character. A helpful illustration for glory is 
is uh, either a light bulb or you could think of the sun, the rays of light projecting from the sun. This majestic, bright, <clears throat> gaseous ball in the sky projects its light. And what we see, these rays of light coming toward us, is the glory of the sun. God's character is perfect and holy. And we see it through the glory as it displays itself in action. Now, I, as much as we speak of his glory, it is very much inexplicable to encapsulate with words but but we see attempts remember exodus 34 when moses asked god show me your glory and god tells him well i i can't show you who i am fully or you'll die but i can speak about my attributes to you in a way where you can hear them and live he shows Moses, Yahweh, Yahweh, a, 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 a God merciful and slow to anger. And he begins to speak to, to Moses of who he is. Interestingly, in Exodus 34, he, he sort of <clears throat> concludes that, that revelation of self by telling Moses that he is a God of steadfast love and faithfulness. Now, he can't show himself fully because that would have killed Moses. But he speaks of who he is, and he says, Moses, to, to sum up my majesty, I am a God of steadfast love and faithfulness. And, and Moses' response is to bow down and worship at such revelation. But I want us to notice something interesting. In, in God's response to Moses, he reveals his glory in word by, by steadfast love and faithfulness. In the Hebrew, it's the words hesed and emet. And I only say that to say this, that to, to translate hesed and emet, steadfast love and faithfulness, into the Greek language would be translated charis kialathia, the words grace and truth. So as God reveals himself in his glory to Moses, he says, Moses, I am a God of steadfast love and faithfulness. And then you remember those words that John reveals in John 1.14, Jesus Christ, full of charis kai aletheia. If he were to have written that in Hebrew, Jesus Christ, full of hesed and emet. Obviously, English mixed in. Grace and truth. What John in his gospel is revealing is that whereas Moses could only hear of God's glory, we now in the person of Jesus Christ see God's glory. We see it in the fullness of who Christ is. And that's exactly what the preacher here in Hebrews 1 is saying. Jesus is the full radiance of the glory of God. He is the sunbeams of God's glory. Christ radiating the glory and perfection of the divine. And he'll go on in detail to show that this glory is beyond the glory that angels possess. This glory is beyond the glory that even a man like Moses possesses. This glory surpasses that of any priest in Israel's history. This is the glory of God revealed in the person of Christ. Not only is he the radiance of the glory of God, but forth he, Jesus, the divine he says the, he is the exact imprint of his nature. <coughs> Again, interesting words here that the preacher uses to describe Christ. The exact imprint of his nature. Um, these, this was a, a term that would have been common in the, in the Greek world to speak of a reproduction or a stamp. Often used to describe coins, um, a face imprinted on a coin. It, it literally the exact imprint of his nature. Jesus Christ bears the very stamp of God's nature. He is the embodiment of God. 
to see Jesus is to see the Father. Remember that conversation with Philip. Lord, show us the Father. Oh, have I been with you so long? When you have seen me, you have seen the Father. Now, we need to understand a bit of the historical significance here to get the weight of that statement. This is, I mean, massive for all of us, but even more so for the the Israelites. You think about the Israelite history and the great lengths that they went to in order to to host the glory of God. They they had to build a tabernacle with with intense, detailed instructions of who could go where, when, in order that God would descend in his glory and, and remain with them. The, the, the Ark of the Covenant, remember that they had very specific instructions of, of where they could carry this Ark, which symbolized God's presence, and, and he would come and, and in a symbolic way enter the Ark, and if you even touched it, you would die. And the, the Israelites revered this Ark and revered the tabernacle and the temple, and, and they went to great lengths to host the glory of God in their midst. And here they're being told that that glory is gone in that form. It's done. Th- those, those requirements of hosting the glory in, in the physical because the glory has def- descended upon them in a person. Unlike ever before, it's here in the person that we talked to and walked with and, and ate with, the person of Jesus Christ. He is the glory of God the exact imprint of his nature. There is no stronger statement that could be made about the person of Christ. The preacher is affirming that everything that God is, the Son is. No created being could make that statement. Would you say of yourself that you are the radiance of his glory, the exact imprint of God's nature? Friends, this is an unequivocal declaration of deity. Jesus, the divine. He goes on in verse three to show us Jesus, the sustainer. He upholds the universe by the word of his power. Not only does he create the world by his word, but he sustains all things by his word. You know, I I really think we can slip into a sort of practical deism in our lives where um, we acknowledge Jesus created the world, but we don't realize his active upholding of it. And I mean a practical deism because we wouldn't ascribe to a doctrinal statement that says that, but we just kind of walk through our day unaware of his sustaining power. Every breath you've breathed from the moment you walked in, from the moment you were created, has been given to you from God. The blood coursing through your veins right now, flowing by the command of God's word. You know, if you are thinking right now, which I hope you are, a hundred billion neurons are firing off in your brain, generating those thoughts. They're being sustained by the word of God. Abraham Kuyper famously said, there's not one square inch in the whole domain of our human existence over which Christ, who is sovereign over all, does not cry, mine. The word of God, the word of Christ, creates and sustains the physical being upheld by the very breath of Jesus. It's a remarkable reality, the dependence we have upon this Jesus. Look again in verse 3. He moves on from this power of creation and sustaining to make a statement about sin and how Christ is the purifier. This is reality of Christ, number 6, Jesus the purifier, He says, after making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty 
on high. Again, in that Jewish context, we, we have to th- remember the, the rituals that would have absorbed their traditions and their, their life. The rituals of sacrifice, offerings for sins. And what the preacher is saying is that Jesus did what no priest could ever do. He purifies sinners from their sin and then sits down. You know, no priest ever sat down. In all of the chapters of Exodus detailing specific instructions for the tabernacle, you put this ephod here, you you have these measurements here, you put this altar here, there's never instruction for building a chair because there's no chair in the tabernacle, because no one sits down in the tabernacle, because the work is never done in the tabernacle continual offering. Um, <clears throat> after dedicating uh, the, the um, tabernacle, uh, David says in 1 Chronicles 29 that they offered sacrifices to Yahweh, um, a thousand bulls, a thousand rams, a thousand lambs. It's one day of a special consecration offering. And if you think 3,000 animals is a lot, When Solomon dedicated the temple, Solomon offered in 1 Kings 8, we read, he offered as peace offerings to the Lord 22,000 oxen and 120,000 sheep. Think of the the butcher house, the, the bloodbath. That that event, to have hundreds of thousands of animals slaughtered and sacrificed to the Lord. My friends, there was no chair in the temple. But Jesus, he sat down after making purification for sins. It's why on the cross he cried, to Telestai, it is finished. The final lamb has been sacrificed. He made us clean from sin once and for all. He did what bulls and goats could never do. We'll hear that later in chapter 10. And friends, notice, where did he sit down? Well, he sat down where Psalm 110 prophesied he would, the throne of God at the right hand of the Father. Friends, this is King Jesus declared. Look at verse 8. But of the Son, he says, Your throne, O God, is forever and ever. The scepter of uprightness is the scepter of your kingdom. Jesus Christ sat down in royal kingship after purifying his people from their sins. Jesus, the purifier. And finally, we see Jesus, the Son, Verse 4, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. Uh, We're going to explore this next week in greater detail. Joey will give us approximately a four and a half minute sermon (laughs) on chapter 1, maybe some of chapter 2, which could take the sermon to five minutes. Um, But let me say this, this introduction and comparison with angels may initially seem a little strange, a bit sudden. Why does he all of a sudden compare Jesus with angels? And I think it's important to note two things. One, that word superior. This is the first of of 12 times mentioned in Hebrews. Superior. We'll see that theme. Um, And he's superior because of his name. He's been given a greater name than the angels have ever received, that of son. We see that in verse 5. But there's another reason for this introduction of, of Jesus being greater than angels. And I, have, uh, <clears throat> I believe it has to do with the way that this introduction is being preached and structured. And there's something here that shows us the incredible detail that the preacher took in delivering this message. Um, this is what's called a, a chiasm or a chiasm. 
And it's a logical argument that the preacher takes us to, sh- to, to show us the greatness of Christ here. And he begins, if you notice in verse 1, showing us that Jesus was better than the prophets. Long ago, God spoke through the prophets, but now he, he's revealed himself through Jesus. And in verse 2, he showed us that Jesus is the messianic heir, the the one who fulfills Psalm 2, the ruler and owner of all things, before showing us Jesus the creator. And, And reaching the climax of his argument, Jesus Christ, the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature, Jesus, the very glory of God himself. But then he begins to work back and show not only did Jesus work as creator, but he worked as sustainer. What he began, he is upholding. And not only is Jesus the messianic heir, Jesus is the messianic king. And not only is Jesus greater than the prophets, he's greater even than the angels. And if that doesn't hit you with force immediately, let me explain how it would have the Jewish audience. At the two ends of this chiasm, we mention those who brought the revelation of God to his people, the prophets. But the prophets were not the ultimate source. It came to them, the word of God, often through angels. We see this in chapter 2, verse 2, the message declared by angels. In Acts chapter 7, we read of Moses receiving the law from angels. And so what the preacher is doing here is proving a point to his Jewish and Jewish-informed and influenced audience that Jesus is greater even than the angels. Next week, we'll see in verse 5, for to which of the angels did God ever say, you are my son? He's saying, if the prophets hold weight in your mind, they receive their message from angels, and Jesus is above even the angels in speaking the word of God. Jesus is better. And so, friends, as we close, discouragement is a reality in the Christian life. What you believe as a Christian at one time with so much, so much force and so much conviction can at times feel like it's numbing in your senses and being slowly pulled away from your affections. In this life, Bunyan described it accurately as a dangerous journey filled with suffering and sin. And so often we are bruised and battered. And discouragement comes. And there's even at times a kind of discouragement which screams at you to doubt Jesus himself. Friends, that is why Hebrews was written. I want us to take us back for a final word to that fictional scene with Antonius, our friend. Discouraged and downtrodden, as Antonius sat alone in his night, he remembered that the believers were scheduled to meet for worship and encouragement. Rumor had it that the leaders had received a document from back east somewhere. Although discouraged and tempted to skip the meeting again, Antonius' curiosity was aroused, and he decided to travel the short distance to the neighborhood house where the church would meet. Entering the gathering room, he spoke greetings to several friends who also looked tired from the day's work. The hostess offered something to drink and friendly banter, but dejection hung like a cloud over the room. When the meal was finished, the group's leader, a good and godly man of almost 70 years, finally arrived. Joseph was his name, and he was a bit out of breath, having come from a meeting with other leaders halfway across the city. He was visibly moved as he stood smiling before the group of about 20 people, his hands shaking slightly from advancing age. 
After a few words of introduction, Joseph took a deep breath and explained that he had talked the other leaders into allowing his group the first reading of this scroll. With a twinkle in his eye, the elder said, I think you'll find this to be quite relevant. He unrolled the first part of the parchment and began reading with vigor. In the past, God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his son. Friends, I think that fictional scene is a very real one in our lives as we walk through the discouragement of the Christian life. And if that fictional scene were to continue, I think those 20 hungry, tired, hurting people, after hearing this message from this preacher, would have left reinvigorated, encouraged, and strengthened in their faith. Friends, that's my hope for you and for me. Maybe that's not your experience right now, but friends, discouragement is coming. Take Hebrews and put it in your back pocket. Write it on your heart. Take the lessons of, of looking to Christ, this divine Messiah, this king who rules and reigns, this one who is the very glory of God, the exact imprint of his nature, and allow him to fixate your mind and your heart, to consume your soul, that you would look away from the present circumstances and on to this glorious king and find rest and peace and hope along the way. Let's pray. Father, we hope to see Jesus in your word. Show us Christ in all of his glory and let us find encouragement and strength in this journey. Lord, as we wrestle against our flesh and wrestle against the hostile world, help us to find refuge in King Jesus. And as we look at him in all his glory, Father, you promise that we will be transformed into his image from one degree of glory to another. Maybe that be our reality, Father. Show us Christ, and may we become like him, we ask in the name of Christ. Amen.